So with all of that under your belt, let's talk about you working with records. So we're going to go over some best practices here for those of you who were here yesterday. Some of this will be repetitive, but then again, these things bear repeating. For books that have the same content, as long as they are print books, you should put them on the same record, even if one is a hardcover and one is a paperback. Even if they have different publishers and publication dates, as long as the content is the same, put them on the same record. Even if they're different sizes or shapes or paginations, go ahead and put them on the same record. Now, there is a way to differentiate between the books that you put on the same record. So you have the hardcover, you're putting it on the paperback record, the pagination doesn't match your resource, the ISBN doesn't match your resource, you want to create access to your resource. Don't go change what somebody else has there, but you can add stuff about what you have. So what you can do is in bib formats you can actually find all the coding for this. So for example for your ISBN that goes in the O2O field, you can use a Q subfield and actually say in that Q subfield like hardcover or hardback or paperback. So you can actually put in the ISBN or ISBNs that you have and put down that it's for the hardcover or the paperback. And that way not only have you created access to that ISBN but you've said why it's there. And you've made clear to other people coming along that it's it may indeed be the same thing they have. There are times when you will not use a single bibliographic record for books that have the same content. So if they are different editions, special edition versus no edition whatsoever, a second edition versus a revised edition or a first edition. The one exception here is if your book says first edition and your record doesn't say anything and everything else matches up, they're probably the same thing, don't worry about it. Different sizes of print, so your large print and your regular print don't go on the same resource. Any kind of classics that include special material, analysis, introduction, anything like that, um, those would be separated out onto different, onto different records. Because you have so much supplemental information that can be useful to people, and especially like teachers would find this very useful, sending their students out and saying, you know, I want you to get the one with the introduction by so-and-so. Now, this may not hold, you have to t use your judgment with this. So if you have something that has like a two-page foreword by somebody, it's probably not that important. But if you have something, you know, one of those ones where the foreword is like 30 pages long and then they have notes throughout and all these little, you know, footnotes and things. That's pretty significant in the difference that you'll see. So you have to have a certain amount of judgment with that. Illustrated editions go on different records from text only editions. If you have different illustrators or different translators, these get separated out onto different records because they become different. I mean, the different illustrations mean that the information is being presented differently. The different translator will use different language. And that can be really important for scholars or for students who want to find specific translations and not other ones. Um, so that's something that where you would create a new record or look for a new record. And then different formats. So while you may put hardcovers and paperbacks on the same record, you never put an ebook on the same record with a print book. You never put an audio book on the same record with an ebook. These are different things. So you have sort of a checklist here that you can go through when you're thinking, you know, should I put this on the same record or should I put it on something different? And this can help you make that decision. With large print books, these should always go on a different record. You should make sure that the information that it is large print appears on the record. So it should go in the GMD, which is the 
H subfield in the 245 in square brackets. It should say large print. It should be in the fixed fields. The form should be D. If this is not the case, you will not generate the icon for large print books. A note in the 500 or a subject heading for large type books, which you can do. Um, it's a 650 for whatever reason, but it's large type books. Do not take a regular print record that you easily found and just stick the large print book on there. And I'm talking about where you have the regular print record and you think, well, if I just change the ISBN and the pagination, no one will know. Yeah, but it's actually an, in, it, a unique Library of Congress number, possibly OCLC number in that 035. And you've now messed it up, and when the little bots come through and start deduping your catalog, guess where your large print record's gonna go? It's going in there with the regular print record that it matches, and now you've lost your record. So, what I usually would do with large print books when I had the regular print record and not the large print record, and it was something like the romance novels, I'd put it on the wait a week shelf. And probably in a week it would have it would have come into the catalog and I wouldn't have to think. If it's something less mass market than romance novels, you may have to go and look through Z3950 and see if you can find a new record to import, if there's not one already. So Never take a record also, same thing, and convert it to another type. So don't take the DVD record and just change that one little field in the 007 to Blu-ray and call it a day. Again, there are identification numbers that are screaming like, this is not correct, and at some point something's going to happen and your record's not going to look the same. So create a new record, find a new record somewhere, go to Z3950, it's probably out there somewhere. So print books are not the same thing as audiobooks, ebooks are not the same thing as print books, DVDs are not the same things as Blu-rays. When you get vendor records that have ISBNs for other types of materials, strip those out so you've got a print re resource record and it's got an ebook ISBN in it, get rid of that. You know, obviously you're not going to get rid of extra ISBNs if they're for other print books because somebody else may have put that in there for books that they added to the record. But if it's quite obviously for an ebook or an audiobook and you've got the print book, get rid of it because it's just going to make life more difficult. So far, so good. More things you can delete. Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> Dealing with multi-part sets is something that we mostly do with the DVDs these days. These are resources that are made up of multiple volumes, but they are part of a set that all goes together. So what you do is you have a bibliographic record for the set, which is going to be the season if it's a television show or um, whatever that group is. So if you've got the DVD and the Blu-ray together, you, the set would be both of those together. If you've got encyclopedias, the record is for the whole set of encyclopedias, all 20 volumes or whatever. Then you can list each of the parts separately. Each can be checked out separately, placed on hold separately, or you can list them in different groupings or all together. Your library may decide every, you know, you check out all the discs in the season. They're all together, they're packaged together, we don't care, check the whole thing out. But maybe Library B likes to keep a tight rein on things and wants to check the discs out one at a time. So they can have disc one, disc two, disc three, disc four, and then you can customize from there. There is a vocabulary coming for that, and then you'll have a universal vocabulary throughout the consortium for these multi-part sets. You have lots of magazines in your library, don't you? For those, cataloging them, make sure they all go on one record. So you create one record or use one record for the magazine no matter what 
issues you have on your shelves, no matter when you started to subscribing, no matter when you stopped subscribing. This actually gives you a lot of freedom and a lot of flexibility because you can simply add what you have, don't add what you don't have, and take off what you don't have anymore using that one master record and just adding volumes to it. With graphic novels, go ahead and catalog each item, each volume separately, at least for now. There are some weird exceptions to this, as we talked about a little bit yesterday, but those will be addressed at a later date. Uh, with most graphic novels, you get a book and it says that it's like volume one of this series, but at the same time, it's like issues 1 through 50 from a magazine and you don't really know how many volumes are going to be in the series and it's just sort of a mess. So just catalog each one separately. You can use a series statement to tie it together with the other ones that are related to it. So all, you know, you get in um, Hero Fights Villain Volume 1 and it's part of the series for heroes and vill villains at each other's throats. So you can put Hero Fights Villain, Villain Volume 1 in your title. You can put heroes and villains at each other's throats in your series statements. You've created access <laughs> that way to the whole series and also to that volume. Does that sort of make sense? If graphic novels completely confuse you, you're not alone. I'm coming up with something. Stay tuned. <laughs> Come fall, there should be something out there to hopefully help people deal with graphic novels because they're special. E-resources are also special. Um, so if you find bibliographic re records for electronic resources in your catalog, anything that requires authentication through another website should never have any physical holdings attached. So hopefully you know what that means. If you don't know what that means, maybe you don't work with a lot of ebooks. If you're really confused about what that means, you might talk to the cataloging committee because it's sort of jargon specific to what goes on in Evergreen. So these records that don't have any physical holdings attached should include an 856 field with a subfield Y, and that subfield Y will link will show link text showing the vendor or group for batch import of e-resources. So this is just creating a way to access these e-books through vendors. So make sure that that 856 subfield Y is there. So you leave those, but you delete 856 fields that don't link to the actual resource. So if you have um, You've got a book that has an 856 field for a table of contents. Delete. 856 field for the cover art. Delete. That's not where the cover art that shows up in the catalog comes from anyway. So don't leave that there just because you think it's going to bring you pretty cover art. It's not going to help. If the table of contents is that important, you're probably going to put it in your record. So get rid of those extra 856 fields. Um, it's hard to keep them up to date. It's hard to keep the links working, so don't bother. You've got enough to do <laughs> without dealing with that. But some bibliographic records for physical resources will have an 856 field that links to a digital PDF of the print version. Don't delete these. This is something that the um, State Library Archives does for some things and if you delete that you've deleted something that they've taken some time to actually put in there to enhance access for patrons and then they get upset. So if you've got a link to a PDF in there just leave it. You don't have to add a subfield Y in there. You don't have to do anything just leave it where it is. So PDF good other outside stuff bad. 